So there are things that Jesus tells us that are recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, about the second coming. And these things are predictive prophecy. They predict the future. And that's always dangerous because there's never enough for us. When we see the details of the future, there's never enough. We always try to figure out more about it. It's just human nature. And of course, that's gotten uh, the church people and many church people in trouble because they're reading in all these things and trying to figure out this and that. Jesus said, look, I want you to watch for these signs that are gonna happen. Now, I've heard preachers say, we don't watch for signs, we watch for his coming. Well, that's, uh, that's not biblical. Uh, Jesus said over and over, watch. And let me uh, just uh, read a, a passage of scripture in Mark to you right now to just confirm that. Jesus says in Mark chapter uh, 13, in verse 24, he says, but in those days, after the tribulation, now it's not after the tribulation, it's after that tribulation. That's a specific tribulation. There's always been tribulation. When Jesus was here, he said to his disciples, in the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But all through the history of the church, even before that, the faithful to God always faced problems, persecution, trouble, and sometimes extreme to the place of torture and death. It's always happened, why? Because the father of lies hates the truth and he organizes the evil that's already here in the world to try to destroy the gospel if he can. And he's been working on it for centuries and he's gonna get to the place where he suppresses the gospel. He doesn't exterminate it, but Jesus said there's gonna come a time when you who preach the gospel, who live the gospel, who know it's true, will be hated by all, 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 all. And that means there'll be no country where you can go where they accept you as a real born again believer. You can have a form of Christianity. You can get into the worldly church, you can get into the carnal church, you can get into the organized religion, but, but they won't permit you to have, I am the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. That's anathema to the world. Uh, they, they can't stand that. And it's, of course, a natural man's resistance to the truth of God. You know, God has revealed himself in one person, in one major way. Now, he's revealed in nature. You look at nature, it's unbelievable. If you have eyes to see uh, the hand of God in everything, every single thing. I, 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 as I ride along and I look at the trees, trees just grow everywhere they can. We chop down, uh, I think it's a, a 10, million, 10 billion trees a year, not just foresting, but in just to build things and stuff. Uh, but yet the trees just keep growing, growing, grow, grow right up to the road. And, and, and those trees are a source of life for us. They could produce oxygen. Without them, we would die. We couldn't live. And these trees are an effusion of life and it's God's eternal energetic life that's in these trees. Now it's not spiritual life, it's material physical life, but it's the life power of the creator in these things. He's in it all. Uh, and, and it goes for the animals, it goes for everything. And you know, uh, I, I, was, I was, I know you might think this is nuts, but if you do, you, you've got a problem, <laughs> okay? The, but when I, I was eating, I love uh, hard boiled eggs now, uh, for some reason. I chop them up, put olive oil on them, you know? Uh, but anyway, um, when I was, I was getting ready to peel an egg and I thought to myself, this is a miracle. Who designed this? Who thought of it? to have these chickens that produce eggs that we can eat and they're so healthful and there's billions of them and they've been around since the beginning. This is a one tiny little miracle gift from God, an egg. Can you see that? Can you see, who, whoever thought of such a thing? Before God created all that is, there were no other ideas. It, he's the creator from nothing. And he produces eggs, tomatoes, uh, fruit, apples, all, 
millions of kinds of food for us and it's a fallen world and it's under condemnation for its rebellion against God and yet he pours out his blessings it says the whole earth is filled with his goodness and it is it's called theologians call it common grace God is good rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous the sun rises on the just and the unjust such a creator God and then he's a sustainer he upholds all things by the word of his power and by the way that description goes to Jesus he is the expression of God that created in the beginning was the word the word was with God all things were made by him and without him, not one single thing was made that was made, and that's Jesus. So somehow Jesus, before he became a human, when he was the glory of God as a, a, a sort of a person like us, even though he was eternal in heaven, he was the creator. God, through Christ, created everything. But that just, it, it, do you see it? Do you feel it? Do you sense it? You know, it's so, it's so sad to, to not realize the, the power and the perfections and the, the beauty and the gracious goodness of God for what he's given us. And you look at all the things man has done. He's given man not only the skills and the energy to do all these things, build these things, make these things, but he created the uh, arithmetic, the mathematics of nature so man can figure things out and do all that he, I mean, all this came from nothing, from our God. Do you see it? Do you see it? I want you to feel it. But anyway, so back to the scripture, I uh, tend to, to get off a little there, but um, he says, immediately after that tribulation. So there's always been trouble. There's always going to be trouble for Christians, but there's going to be a special bad time just preceding Christ's second coming. And, and the Bible makes it clear, and I think you have to take it literally, that it's a period generally, not, not exactly because it says the days will be shortened, but about seven years before Jesus appears, comes in power and glory and gathers his people together. Just before that, the Bible says, there's gonna be a time of tremendous tribulation. We'll hope to look, to a look at a little bit of that. But that's what he's referring to right here, where he says, so Jesus here is talking, he says, immediately after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, and that may mean just the smoke and pollution and from all the war and stuff that's going on, or there may be some heavenly problem. But anyway, the stars of heaven shall fall, and that, of course, could mean uh, not literally stars, but... Uh, the, you know, the uh, comets and things like that that possibly uh, can hit the earth and uh, ast uh, asteroids and so forth. And then they shall see, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Now that's incredible, just think of it. There's gonna be all this trouble, all these problems, there's going to be this incredible natural disasters that are pointed out in Revelation where the judgment of God falls on it and the Lord Jesus is going to come. Matthew says they'll see his sign in the heavens and then he will, he will come. He adds that. And then he says this, um, verse 29, when you see these things come to pass, he says, you'll know that the it's at the door. What's at the door? Verse 27, when he comes in power and great glory, it says he shall send his angels and gather together his elect that saved from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. That's what people call the rapture. And that's immediately after the tribulation of those days. And then he says, there's a parable of the fig tree. When you see the fig tree, you know certain things are going to happen. But here's what he says in verse 29. When you see these things come to pass, know it's at the doors. And then he says in verse 33, take heed, watch, and pray. Watch. What do you watch for? Well, you don't. You don't watch for Jesus coming. 
you watch the signs that point to his coming, and then through that, you know he's coming, so you watch for his coming. But first, you watch the things that are happening. When the, when the disciples saw Jesus ascend back to heaven in the uh, first chapter of the book of Acts, the ascension, and in Luke, where Jesus ascends back to heaven after the resurrection, the disciples are all standing there gazing up because he literally went up and a cloud took him out of sight. And he had told them, he says, when they started doubting things, he said, what are you going to do when you see me go up, uh, the Son of Man go up out? And, and it, here was the time when he left them physically to come back spiritually uh, through the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But this is just before Pentecost. And the disciples are there gazing up. And a couple of angels said to him, to them, uh, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which you have seen go will come in same manner. And, and that's why he ascended physically. Jesus could have just vanished and gone back to heaven, but he gave us a picture. He says, this is, I'm going up, I'm coming back. Literally, physically, actually. And uh, you know that when you look at the world, and you look at the laws of nature, you look, everything is, that's why Peter said people mock because they say, well, things have always been this way. They'll always be this way. I mean, who would even think somebody would come from out of the sky? Well, exactly, exactly what's going to happen. But here's the point. In verse 33, he says, watch and pray. And then in verse 34 of Mark chapter 13, the son of man is as a man taken a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter or the manager to watch. And then he says to verse 35, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house comes at evening, midnight, cock crowing, or morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping when you should be working. And uh, spiritually, you can be sleeping and still be awake physically and be sleeping spiritually because your uh, mind is so full of the things of this life and the cares of this life. The final verse, 37, and what I say to you, Jesus says, I say unto all, watch, watch. And what it means is be alert, be awake, and, and, and be never, never forget that our future involves the coming of the Lord Jesus. We may not be here when he comes, we may be gone by then, maybe not. Seems like times are getting much closer than, and some people you know, think it already uh, should have happened, but we're getting into those, uh, I believe we're on the edge of the seven year period. And Jesus makes it plain that the, it's after that tribulation time. Now, there's another scripture I want to uh, share with you, and that's in uh, first Thess Second Thessalonians. So if you have your Bible and you're following along, uh, in Second Thessalonians, uh, Paul is writing, and he writes to the church there to comfort them and encourage them because they are they have heard things that weren't true about the second coming. Now that's very easy to do because there's a lot of stuff about the second coming going around that are men's theories and ideas that go beyond the Bible. Well, somebody did it back in the first century, maybe many times, but in this case, the church of Thessalonica, this is up the coast of Greece, just below Macedonia, just by the Aegean Sea there. Paul had started this great church there and Paul writes to them and says, I don't want you to be upset. I don't want you to be upset. I hear you're upset. Now I'm, you know, paraphrasing. Paul says, I hear you're upset. You're upset because somebody claimed that God told them, or somehow it's in the Bible, that the day of the Lord is already here. The day of the Lord. Boy, what a statement that is. Isaiah says it, Amos, Zephaniah, Obadiah, all these guys mention the day of the Lord. And there's two things about the day of the Lord. It means it's the day when God actually intervenes in history. There were many of such days in the Old Testament 
where God would intervene in history. And especially when it brought judgment on Israel, that was considered the day of the Lord. And he warns them and warns them. And he says, you know, the day of the Lord is coming. You can't keep worshiping idols. You can't keep killing your children, putting them through the fire. You can't keep grinding the faces of the poor. You can't keep stealing your neighbor's wife and living in adultery. You can't do these things continually and still go to the temple and worship and then go back and do these things without paying a price. And God warned them and warned them and warned them, chastened them, chastened them, chased them. Finally, he said, okay, it's, now you just need to be punished, not corrected, chastised, punished. Justice, you need to get what you deserve. And it's called the day of the Lord. But there's another side to the day of the Lord. Because whenever the day of the Lord is mentioned, the other side is it's a time of great joyful deliverance for the true people of God. Why? Because as the day of the Lord approaches, the people persecute the true believers. They rejected the prophets. They killed them. And in the New Testament, they rejected the preaching of the gospel. They do even today. But just before that time when God brings judgment, he always, he always protects and helps his people who are being persecuted. And then when the day of the Lord comes and the judgment they get a great deliverance. This is a pattern and it becomes a picture of the end times. During these seven years, just before Jesus comes and takes us out of here forever to glory, uh, when he says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise and we shall be caught up together with him. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort ye one another with these words. And, and this is what we're looking forward to. We don't look forward to, uh, to uh, persecution and trouble. It may come, it may not. Uh, we've been blessed so far in this country, but the day may come when we have to deal with the kind of persecution the rest of the world is dealing with, having their houses taken away and burned and their churches burned and their people, preachers arrested, their people actually put to death. That's going on all over the world. And, and we, we, we tend to, it's not real to us. We're just so busy doing our thing as believers. We're, we're doing exactly what the Lord said not to do and that is be carried away with the cares of this life. And they're not all bad. But the good things can occupy too much time. Things that aren't bad can become bad in that they take the place of the good and the best. And you've got to watch that because it's so hard to resist the pressures of the culture that just get our attention, tell us this is what we need. You must have this, you should do this, look, and so forth. And it, it affects Christians, of course. Why, we're just human and we have natural desires and the world stimulates it. So anyway, he said, Paul says, somebody told you that the day of the Lord is here, that it's already come. He said, well, let me tell you something. That day of the Lord, which by the way, another parenthesis here, uh, Jesus is described as coming back on the, in the day of the Lord. That's the second coming, the ultimate day of the Lord, the final day of the Lord at the end of history. That's the day of the Lord. These others were intermittent. This is it. And when it happens, he comes in power and glory and takes his people out just before the very end, after persecution, after tribulation, after all kinds of things. You say, what things? Well, let's look and see what the Bible says is gonna happen before he comes. Now, here's what he says. He says, um, verse seven of chapter one, to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now that's not a secret coming. That's the coming in power and glory. And that's what he describes as our gathering together with him. Jesus said, after the tribulation, I will come back and send my angels and gather the elect from one end of heaven to the other. That's this. We will be gathered to him when he's revealed from heaven. In, and he's, he's coming as the day of the Lord on the negative side in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God 
and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the devil and the world and the flesh do a tremendous job of dulling our heads to eternity. We just, I mean, we know we're gonna die. We know when you die, it's forever and ever and ever and ever. And yet we just push it out of our minds. Not so much for ourselves, because if we believe in Jesus, we know the Lord, we look forward to being with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, no problem for us. But how about all those around us who don't know him and are caught up in the, what this chapter calls a strong delusion? And the delusion is that eternity is really not real, that the religious things and spiritual stuff is not important. That's a delusion. Why? Because they believe a lie. And, and it's a lie. The most important thing in the world is eternity. The most important thing in the world when your life is over is where you end up. And you know, we talk about, oh, well, you're getting into that hellfire stuff. No, the Bible is very vague about the nature of hell. You say, it's pretty specific to me. No, he talks about, you know, fire. And he also talks about outer darkness. He talks about utter destruction. So there are all these symbolic words to talk about where people go when they can't go to heaven because they have rejected Christ. Now, I'm not saying, you know, if a person never heard of Jesus, that's another matter. God takes care of that. If people aren't able to understand, that's another thing. But when people in their hearts willfully hold God off, don't want, ignore him, neglect him, reject him, then that's a, that's, a, that's a dreadful, dreadful sin. That's worse than all the breaking the commandments to resist God's great love and mercy through Christ who died for you on the cross so you can be washed clean and have eternal life. To resist and reject that, to not want to hear it, uh, to hear it and say, well, out on later, that People like that are not going to go to heaven. And we've got loved ones. I've got loved ones that I just cry to God. And I use that very statement. I say, Lord, Lord, hear my cry. Hear my cry. And, and, and I was reading the Psalms, and the psalmist said that very thing. Hear my cry. My cry that you will save these people. I can't do it. I can try to witness. I can try to live it. I can try to be good and show them there's a difference. I can't make them happy. It takes the power of God and it's released through the prayers of his people who live right. Whatsoever we ask, we receive because we keep his commands. So you can't use prayer as a substitute for obedience. Obedience gives you the power to pray so God can release his power. He's ordained it that way that his salvation goes through the prayers of his people. That's why he left us here. We can't all be evangelists. We can't all be personal soul winners. No, don't beat yourself up because you don't go out and knock on your neighbor's door and do the uh, Jehovah Witness thing or whatever. No, all God asks is that you live in his will with his peace and joy, his obedience, his love, and let your light shine so they may see your good works. You don't have to tell them, see. God can open doors for you to speak, and that's fine, and he'll give you the words to speak when the time comes. Meanwhile, prayer makes it happen. That's why it says watch and pray. What are you gonna pray for? He's coming back, you don't have to pray for him to come back. You don't have to pray that he'll take you. That's all settled. You don't have to pray that he'll forgive you. You're washed in the blood. What do you pray? You pray for the lost. You pray for your loved ones who will miss heaven. That's horrible, I gotta pound that into your head. And you say, well, that takes away the fun out of life. Well, too bad. I mean, you know, we were put here to laugh. That's our culture, laughs at everything, everything's funny. Comedians are like the power of the, of the, of the culture, what they say and what they do. That's sick. The whole thing is sick, it's phony, it's empty. All this, this human glory is, is like nothing uh, compared to reality of eternity in heaven. And only God can make that, I pray he makes that real to you. I pray every day I go across this congregation, I know just where you sit, I know just where you are, 
And every time I pray, I look right at you out there and ask God to give you the fullness of his spirit and the power of his presence and the peace of God and opportunities, especially the spirit of prayer. So you will pray for your loved ones. So it says he's coming in flaming fire to bring ju judgment and those who will be punished with what? Everlasting destruction. That's a, one of the forms of hell. And he says in that day, wherefore, verse 11, also pray always. There it is, pray always. So God will count you worthy of his calling. You're worthy through the blood of Christ, but you gotta pray. And then he says in verse uh, two, uh, one chapter two, he says, now I beseech you, listen, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Okay. He says, now you're worried that it already happened or it's already happening. Well, I'm gonna tell you it hasn't happened yet. Why? Because certain things have to happen first. And these are the signs I want you to be aware of and watch for. And I'm just going to read you what Paul says. He says, uh, you're troubled by spirit or in a letter or somebody. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come until there first be an apostasy of falling away. And of course, persecution causes that and sin causes that. And it means Christianity is going to become a form of religion without the power. And that is the way the church is in America today. It's pathetic. Even the Bible-believing churches are hollow and empty. And the preacher sounds like a, a lecture, religious lecture or something. Or a, a, a lift yourself by your bootstraps or get rich or this or that or the other thing. And uh, there's, there's no eternal crying out to God for salvation. He says, so they... That, that, that there's gonna be a falling away. People are gonna fall away. And then he says, w until, and that man of sin be revealed. So there's gonna be a man of sin, an antichrist, a beast, is gonna be revealed before Jesus comes back. That's what he said to our gathering. And then he goes on to describe how he lifts up everything against God, makes himself God, does all these things. And then in um, the verse eight, it says that wicked one will be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So for Revelation says for about three, three and a half months, this guy is gonna be given power over the whole earth. And that's when all hell breaks loose on the earth and God sends his judgment. Before that, just before that, he takes us up to meet him in the air. So we don't worry about that part, but we wanna be ready when he comes. Okay, I'm gonna end there. Uh, so my challenge to you is to realize that this is the truth of God. And you've gotta say, how does this affect my life? And I can say the easiest thing in the world is to pray. Anybody can pray, little children can pray. Talk to God, he's listening, he's waiting. His eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are committed to him. With the sound of